like a colossus, it stands tall in the midst of other structures. Its soaring physical attributes apparently depicts its significance to the Nigerian economy. It's from here the policy decisions governing operations of intermodal transportation in Nigeria is considered. This is the Ministry of Transportation. As its name implies, Chibike Wotimiamichi is riding on the supernatural strength of God as he runs with the vision of transforming the transport sector into a world-class experience. Speaker 34, Governor at 42, and Minister of Transportation at 50. Today on Inspirators, his journey from obscurity to limelight couldn't be more compelling. Welcome to Inspirators. modern Diobu, a suburb in the heart of Port Harcourt. It used to be a bubbling slum from where great minds have been nurtured. Right Honorable Rotimi Chibika Mechi is one of them. For him, growing up in Diobu was not a bed of roses. Rather, he encapsulates his childhood experience with such words as courage and dexterity. You grew up in Diobu, Port Harcourt. How did you know? How was life growing up there? Kayo. Now you will see it's challenging, but then it was not, you wouldn't see it as challenging. Uh, the, the, the image that continues to creep up into my head is the image of the uh, bucket toilet that we used to have. And I had this bad habit of if I see such things, I can't feed for the day. Uh, so I, and I pass through it daily. Uh, I continue to sh imagine the image of you having a running stomach in the morning. You are the fifth person on the queue. <laughs> Only God knows what will happen to you. I, I never experienced it. Then I had this bad habit those days of going to the back of the uh, compound to the stool because I, I couldn't wait. Well, it was a disgusting experience, but again, it shaped my life. And I tell my, this morning I had a conversation with my children. I said I pray every day for people to pass through poverty so that you're able to manage wealth and fame. You know, when you pass through all that, you know, when people accuse me of being arrogant, I say, for Christ's sake. Poor, I had a poor parental background. I, I never had the opportunity of meeting, going to good schools. You couldn't have said, oh, I met you school, we went to school in maybe comprehensive as in those days, or maybe King's College in Lagos. Or, no, one of these local community schools and all that. So what would make me arrogant? Uh, I, I just asked a couple of my religious background where I know that uh, pride is not, an, is not a thing that God, God permits. Success emanates from a blend of experiences, being of hard work and a stroke of fortune. Roti Miyamechi says is all of these at different stages of his ascendancy to prominence. But even in spite of that, you came out strong because you went to school in the University of Port Harcourt and then you entered, ventured into politics. And then from there, your political career, you know, uh, uh, spurred on. Now, what was that driving force that pushed you into politics? I, I, I basically were attributed to God, but I don't want to leave it to chance because what I pastors do these days is to tell people that you don't need to work hard, just continue to pray. And uh, I, I believe that the Bible is very clear about prayer and very clear about working hard. Because the Bible says, uh, hard, uh, says faith without works is death. So what did we do? What I say basically about God is, I'll give you a quick example of God's intervention in my life. I walked into NTA, Fidel Sabiki hears my voice. He says, my friend, has anybody auditioned you before? And I said, no, you need to go to the studio. We need to employ you as a staff of NTA. Hmm? I was excited. I want to be a broadcaster. I want to be seen. I had that notion. I had that desire to be famous. So I was so glad that I was going to be in 
a broadcasting field. I don't know what happened after he I went through the audition. I don't know what happened. I can't remember now. But then I also went through the audition of uh, uh, River State Television. Imagine if I, uh, I was successful. Imagine if I was uh, a broadcaster. I would have been hearing that, uh, that booming sound, that booming voice for me. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so, but somehow, either I wasn't successful, I don't know what happened. I joined politics. I never left politics for them. I left university at the, at the age of 22 in 1987. And then started looking for employment. And basically, I tell people that when Nigerians come out and say, oh, my people, call, nobody called any politician. Nobody called any politician to come and say, there are, everybody, there are different reasons for which people join politics, but basically it's economics. His first romance with politics was as an undergraduate at the University of Port Harcourt, presiding over the National Union of River State Students. His election as secretary of the now defunct National Republican Convention in the Query Local Government area of River State launched him into mainstream politics. Under the wings of former governor of River State, Peter Odili, Rotimi Amechi swirled through ranks and a Kalex saga before emerging governor in 2007 by the ruling of the Supreme Court. But basically now, Mr. Uh, Peter Odili, the former governor of River State, uh, played a major role in, you, in, in your political role. career. Did, and did you know, he, he took you under his wings and then nurtured you. Exactly. Now, what did. were those sterling qualities he saw in you? I wouldn't know. You need to ask that to Dr. Peter Dilley. But one thing anybody who meets me will acknowledge is uh, I don't know whether they accuse me of arrogance, but I, again, I fear God when I say it, but I think I'm a bit honest. You come across as somebody who's actually arrogant. I'm, 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 <laughs> because when I first met you, I was like, okay, he, he looks it. And why are you so convinced you're not arrogant? Why would I be arrogant? <laughs> You, 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 need to, you need to have a very rich background. You need to, and arrogance is not a quality. Definitely not. It's not. It's like looking down on... I, I, I tell you, for instance, tomorrow you can be governor of River State. Tomorrow you can be the president. Imagine when I used to go to the stadium to march for Spiff. I never one day ever dreamt that I would be the governor of River State. So why would you be arrogant to your fellow man? And if you see my culture, if you see my type of life, you would never believe I would be arrogant. First, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't eat alone. Hardly would you see me eat alone. If you see me, therefore, behave in the way I behave, then you can't accuse me of arrogance. I, don't, like I, said, I tell you, I start eating people, and no matter who you are, you can come from the poorest background. When I'm eating, we all eat together. You say yeah, that doesn't mean, that doesn't make, see, make you not to be arrogant. But that makes me feel that, oh, if I'm here now, I was there. What, is, what are my special achievements that will make me arrogant? I have a first degree. Millions of Nigerians have first degree. I have a master's degree. Millions of Nigerians have a master's degree. I have a house cost the university government. There are better houses. So what would be the reason for arrogance? His beliefs in human capital development was convincingly evident by his actions during his term as governor of River State. For Amechi, these are his legacies in the Garden City. See, when I felt it was a big challenge for me to deal with the issue of security, was when the brigade commander went to, the brigade commander went to, then, uh, what's his name, Brigadier General uh, Bello, uh, Sarekin Yaki, that's what they call him, uh, uh, went to Okreka and asked small children playing football. I said, what do you want to be in future? He said, they want to be like Ateke. You know who Ateke is? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I, I, said, I said, our values, are, we are finished. We need to fight this now to stop this kind of value system. And we fought it, and the children began to look up to going to school and not, and not seen as, Ateke as, uh, as a hero, as somebody that they want, to, well, they want him to mentor them. So I've been remembered in River State for those things that I thought I did right. Human capital development is an essential tool. Uh, imagine that uh, today we didn't go to school and then they call us for a meeting in America or, or in the UN. What kind of English? What, 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 what kind of society is that? What about discoveries? What about uh, science? What about challenges? How do you confront them? How do you relate with people and society and others? 
basically, uh, the, for me, uh, when I was governor, for me, as uh, somebody who's in public office, the first tool to a successful society is the human capital development. That's why I didn't take education lightly. I had about 28% budget, budgetary provision for education. The next thing I had of, of, of great interest to me was security. I focused more on security reason, and I didn't focus on security in terms of hardcore security. I focus on what I call social security. Social security basically is to create employment uh, for the people because if you don't, I, I, I had said to people that the responsibility of government is to provide, is to provide um, uh, legal economy, legitimate economy, rather, not legal, legitimate economy. The day you don't provide legitimate economy for the people, they will provide for themselves illeg illegitimate economy. What is illegitimate economy? I'm probably. And I usually call those things the redistribution of wealth. <laughs> because you're here, maybe you're stealing government money, sharing, not giving the poor people opportunity. Tomorrow they begin to carry arms. That arm, uh, I was taught in University of Port Harcourt, and I did it, uh, it, was, it was part of my long essay, my first degree. That arm is a form of resistance, it's protest. That the inequality in society needs, needs to be addressed. Right? So I did all those things to ensure that we reduce crime. So you had opportunity, you had a situation where when I came, people were raising their arms. There was curfew at night. I had to make sure that the curfew was killed, I took away the soldiers from the streets because I provided social security and physical security. I enhanced the wage bill of the police force by paying them allowances and all that to protect the citizens. I created opportunities for citizens to get employed. I had two farms, I had two people overseas for training. I built 150 health centers that looked like hospitals. I built three new hospitals in, uh, in River State. One, one dental center, I only God knows in what state that is now. And then there were roads, power. I built uh, 190 megawatts of power. And then the site constructing the next one that we're about concluding, and 190 megawatts. Uh, so maybe, <coughs> maybe reverse, reverse will remember for education and for security, and for security, both social and uh, political, uh, physical security. What will Nigerians remember me for? What will Nigerians remember me for? Speaking truth to power being part of the system that produced, for the first time, an opposition government. With vital lessons learned on life's journey, he believes the road to success is hard work, regardless of family background or credentials. Lessons he's passing down to his strapping boys and to others around him. I'll give it to God, most importantly, God. My driving force, it frightens me when I, when I begin to think that God is not happy with me. Uh, if you, can, can you imagine that there could be confrontation between an ordinary governor and the president of a third world country like Nigeria? Can you ever imagine that? The only way you can imagine that is if there's a stronger force than the president. And when that fight commenced, we had a vigil one day and we prayed about it. And we said this vigil is dedicated to the fight between us and um, President Jonathan. After the vigil, I told him, go home, we won. And we won. <laughs> so the first driving force is God. The second driving force is, man, you really need to work hard. You, you really need to, that is, when you're hungry, you eat hard. When you're reading, you eat hard. When you, whatever you need to do, you need to work extra hard. So that when you finish, you say, God, yeah, it's not by my, by my strength, but I have put my own contribution. God, now, this is beyond me. It's your turn. And then you will see results. So. Pray, as I tell my children, I say pray hard and work hard. Nothing else comes easy. Nothing. To this point, I was telling them, I called a series of important Nigerians who had died and whose children are not able to manage their parents well. The reason? They never pass through poverty. If you pass through poverty and you see wealth, you'll be scared. If I spend this money now, what will, what will happen to me tomorrow? You'll be able to manage it properly. Now, for a child or a youth, Coming from a background, uh, uh, a humble background, and you know the situation in Nigeria, we know what it is now. How possible is it for that person to get to that point of relevance? Good question. Somebody asked me that question yesterday. Not this, not this type. The question the person asked me is, what do I do to be politically relevant? 
And the person said to me, uh, do I have to begin from the state? And I said, no, you have to begin from the world. You have to get to your world. He said, do I need to be the executive of the world? I said, you don't need to be the executive of the world. You have to just be in the world. I, I think it's a bit difficult for anybody to use my case. That's why you must continue to use God's intervention. Because there are millions of Nigerians who have gone to the world like I went to the world. By the way, I didn't even start from the world. I started from state meeting and then to local government, then to the world. And then, so when I told the person, you have to go to the world, you have to go to uh, um, mobilize people at the world and move to the local government and then move to the state. The person said, but millions of people have done it in the state and they didn't get the opportunity, the kind of opportunity you got. So what is the answer to that? The answer can be also hard work because there are also millions of people who have also worked hard. For me, I just think that it, it would be difficult for me to escape from God. It would be difficult uh, because uh, God singled me out. And that's why I pray that God don't destroy me. <laughs> and that's what arrogance does. Because if you get God angry, then he, he, move, he moves his hand and that will destroy you. So clearly, if you ask me to tell a child what to do, I will continue to say, look, you need to work hard because you may not have the kind of blessings that I have. So after that blessing comes hard work. You must work hard. Beyond those of us who will lay claim to 100% support from God, there are others who also uh, will claim uh, prominence uh, on, on what they have achieved, beyond what their parents have left behind. A lot of Nigerians who have made achievements did not, make their, did not succeed just because their parents were important or rich. If you check well, very few Nigerians will look back and say, my father was X, Y, Z, that's why I'm X, Y, Z. Hard work. My last son is too British. Is that a good thing? About? No, it's not. Minor things affect him. These two boys that passed through primary school to secondary school here, halfway in their second school, they went to the UK. They're hard men. I can scream at them. If I scream at my last son, it's like, Dad, that's child abuse. Why would me screaming at my son be child abuse? Right? Okay, so you ask me, why did you send him overseas? That wasn't my plan. My plan was that my children will pass through primary school, secondary school, uh, first degree in Nigeria if they don't want to go overseas their business. Nigeria is a very hard co uh, country. If you are not that challenging, if you're not that difficult, if you can't face those, that difficult time, you can't survive in Nigeria. Very interesting thing you just said. Nigeria is a very hard country. And then I wonder, how do people like us survive? No, but that's why I wanted my children. If you listen to me today, I told you I said this morning in having a conversation with my first and second son, I said I pray for them every day to pass through poverty. Because that's the only way they can manage wealth. That's the first thing I told you. The same way I had wished that they would be here and finish their first, their primary education, their second education, and their first degree. Because that toughens them up and makes them face Nigerian challenges. Now, why did they go? They left because, don't forget, 2006, I went on self-exile in Ghana. They came after my family. They had to go to the UK. Now, unfortunately, we didn't keep to our promises. I told them, if I lost my case, I would join them in the UK. We'll continue life from there. If I won my case, they will return to Nigeria. When I won my case, all of them, including their mother, everybody, oh, they have already started school. You can't break their school again like you did the one in Nigeria. Let them continue from there. You see, that's, that's the mistake. It's not about wealth, because we didn't have the money. We were looking for money to actually pay their fees. But it's about, it's about the fact that the, my initial plan for them was to pass through the challenges in Nigeria, so that when they finally graduate and they go for masters and all that, and come back, they can face those challenges when they meet them. But now, I'm sure when they see some of those challenges, some of them may not be able to meet them. But I'm sure that my first and second son can manage some of those challenges. But my, first, my last son, I tell him every day, I say, you need to come home for five years. <laughs> you need to really come home. And don't live with me. Look for one of my friends or one of our uncles and stay with, who, do, who will not care about you. I'm a father, so if I see anything going wrong, I will be able to I'll come out and assist. But somebody who, will do, who you have to pass, wake up in the morning like me, eat three times a day, if, you, if, it, if it's available. But those three times, wake up at, at 7, 8 a.m. is Eba. At 12, 1 p.m. is Eba. At 6, 7 p.m., is Eba. Rice and stew 
only either on Sundays or Easter, Christmas, and uh, New Year. Egg, two, three times a year. Not, oh, Dad, no, I don't want this egg. It's not scrambled. It's fried. I want scrambled egg. Then you jettison that one and bring it. That's not what it is. It's not what I pass through. They need to pass through something similar to be able to face the challenges that will come their way. Okay, this is an extension of my library, where my library is full and scattered. In fact, most of my books are now in my bedroom. Either uh, well, I assume I read a lot. <laughs> I assume. An avid reader of literature, his interest cuts across all genre. At 52, Rotimi Amechi is not slowing down anytime soon until his name and reputation is marked for good. All the copies of the panel, I didn't bring the white paper. There is nowhere I was indicted. If the Snape President permits me, I'm ready to lay this on the table so that you can, members can have opportunity of reading it. Nowhere that I was indicted. Now, you've asked me to define corruption. Corruption is very difficult to define. If you're a public officer and you don't take bribe, I have never taken bribe in my life. Is it true? What is bribe? Why would I take bribe? I, I, you know, as if I knew you would interview me on this. My child and I had a conversation today, this morning, about why we should, they in particular, not me. I said, look, my, my life is coming to an end. You see, you're at the end of, at the point where you're going down. Now, what you must live for is your name and your reputation. You should never be found in the situation as my children, where they say you compromise your values and your, your, your reputation. Never. In fact, when people offer me a bribe, I, I will begin to cry. You know, the only person who can offer you a bribe is a man who has seen you that you have put yourself in a position that he can approach you and give you a bribe. So when you do that, ah, why, why do I cry? I begin to think that, my God, I must have put myself, I don't blame you. I begin to blame myself for putting myself in a position that allows you to even approach me. Exactly. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so when you break it, that feature, to tell me you have some money for me, then it's not your fault, it's mine. I must have relaxed in such a way that my value system appears yes. compromised. compromised. Mm -hmm. All right. Having a penchant for unapologetically bearing his mind, Though distasteful for some, Amechi, however, is unapologetic about his belief that doing great things is not for the faint-hearted. A firm believer of no guts, no glory, he says cowardice is one of the banes of the Nigerian youth. Cowardice is a bad thing. <laughs> the reason why Nigeria is where it is today is because nobody is able to confront realities. It's not to go to social media. Huh. It's not a good, don't forget I've been locked before. I've been locked up by EFCC uh, and it, on the top up charge of 20 billion naira. I think I saw 20 billion naira as far back as 19, when was that? When did I become governor? 19, 2007, yeah. EFCC arrested me in 2006. If I saw 40, uh, 20 billion naira, well, that's good money. Yeah. But you must be ready to face those challenges. There are challenges that will come as a young man. It's, this is the time to keep quiet, because I'm 52. I'm, I'm growing old. <laughs> but then I was in my 40s. And I, I was the first Nigerian to say to Nigeria that uh, 49 billion, OK, I, won't, I wasn't the first. The first was uh, Sanusi. But he put it in writing and kept quiet about it. He wrote it to the president that $49 billion was missing from an NPC. So when the document got to me, people were scared. You couldn't have said, you couldn't do this. I said, no, why? <laughs> so I told the president. I told the American government when they came to visit me as governor of Rivers State that $49 billion was missing. I was the first to talk about oil subsidy. That was the height of corruption. So that's what young men and women look up to. For me, and the kids who want me to mentor them, when, if they come near me, they must learn courage. Even now, I don't see what people see I, that I do that's risky. I don't. Because I see it as normal. I don't see me... Let's assume you're the president and you're stealing money. I don't see me telling you that you're stealing money as risky. For him, his work continues as he journeys to confront current realities and write his name in the sands of time. Mm -hmm.